and our recipe for being the difference in the life of your child. Um, what we thought we'd take a few minutes to do is just introduce ourselves a little bit so you'll know a little more about why we're talking about this and what we do. So Holly, do you want to start? Sure. So my name's Holly Oberacker. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and a registered art therapist. And for Navigating ADHD, I work on the symptoms with children, teens, and adults that would have to do with impulsivity, with behavior, social skills, that kind of thing. And then I also work on anything that has, falls under the mental health umbrella. So whether it's in addition to ADHD or separate from, um, and I use a very hands-on approach when I'm in person. And other, when, other than that, I also do virtual appointments and somehow we navigate art therapy through the screens. It, it has been done. Um, Tracy and I have been working together for too many years to count, but we do lots of presentations. We do sessions together, groups, parent support groups, and we combine our approaches so that there can be a wraparound approach for the individuals we work with. Yes. Um, and all of you should know that Holly, you got, you have your name right on the screen, which is fabulous. Usually it pops up with, I'm either Holly and she is Holly or vice versa. And then everyone's confused. So we did it. Problem okay. with sharing a zoom account. <laughs> <laughs> So um, my role at Navigating ADHD is I do all of the um, ADHD and executive functioning coaching um, with some life coaching in there as well. So my role is really developing self-awareness, thinking about whether it's ADHD or not, how does your brain work and how do we make the things that are challenging easier? So sometimes that's time management, dealing with procrastination. Um, sometimes it's all working with a parent on what kind of strategies can they use at home in order to help um, strengthen these things with their child. Um, so like Holly mentioned, we've been working together for quite a while um, and putting our perspectives together. So we think it's really important for all of us as parents, um, all of you, to be thinking about your child as a, a whole unique person. So what are the things on the emotional, social side? And then what are maybe the things on the life and organizational side? Um, and make sure that there's some balance to it all. So that's how we work together. Um, and today's an example of how we do that. So we will jump in. Okay. Um, so, you know, we've, we've talked about being the difference in so many different contexts over the years. And uh, what we wanted to make sure that we did today is that we think about, you know, how do you individually be the difference and how can we make it realistic and concrete? So part of it is thinking about, you know, how do you define being the difference in the life of your child? That looks really different person to person. Um, I think it's probably even changed with the pandemic on, on what that means for us. You know, are we now working at home side by side? Um, our child, are we seeing struggles that we didn't know existed to this extent? Um, are we having to act as a teacher as well as all the other roles that we're doing each day? So we've been spending a lot of this past year working with families and helping people think about this idea of perfection and having to like be at this intense level of doing it all and doing it all right. And what we have learned from our years of doing this is that children just need us to be real. They need us to be there. Um, and knowing that we are doing our best each day. And sometimes our best doesn't look so great. And sometimes our best looks really awesome. But what's most important is that we're just sometimes giving ourselves a break and taking some pressure off and then thinking about, well, if I wanna do this and be the difference, what do I need to do? So that's what we're gonna take a closer look at today. So when we put this all together, um, the recipe for being the difference involves three different steps. And um, if you think about being the difference, it really just, it doesn't take much to have that unconditional support for your child. But if you put it all together, um, with the first step is acknowledging that imperfection is okay, like Tracy was just talking about. Things don't have to go perfectly in order to be the difference for your child. In fact, if there are mistakes, it's 
better because your child can learn that humans do make mistakes and it's okay. And it's what do you do once you do make that mistake? And then the second step is to educate yourself and become the expert on your child and know what the childs are and look at them from, from your perspective and from their perspective. And then the third step is to communicate. You know, threaded through almost everything Tracy and I do involves having good, solid, positive communication um, between parent and child, teacher and child, coach and child. It's just really helping them um, understand what's happening so that they get the message across in a way that their brain understands it. And if you thread positive communication through every interaction you have, then you're automatically going to boost their self-esteem, which will help them grow and flourish. And, you know, when we were putting these steps together and thinking about, you know, what are the most important things we want you to leave with today? You know, these things are not things that, you know, in theory, we think sound like a good idea or, yeah, let's tell them this because it sounds really great. It's more about what, what do we know to be true from clients that we've worked with for years and years? What do we know from our work in schools? What do we know as being parents ourselves? And then putting this all together um, and whittling it down. Because as Jacob said, he could talk about Fusion Academy for hours. You know, we're the same way. We, so this is very difficult for us to boil this down, um, which is why we chose to focus on these three things. Exactly. This is this is going to be a huge challenge for Tracy and I to keep this to an hour because mm. um, and we will warn you that we likely will go over, but we're going to try not to because your time is very valuable. Um, but we could talk about this for hours and hours and hours. So but yes. we'll do our Right. Don't worry. We won't. Right. And we'll leave time for question and answers. Yes. Um, so step one is this idea of acknowledge. So we love this particular meme, I guess you would call it. Um, so just take a moment, moment and read this over. You know, I think all parents at, at different points in time, you know, we feel guilty or we wish we didn't say that or we wish we did that different or the amount of families that come to us and say, oh my gosh, I feel like I just, you know, I messed everything up. I should have started getting help for my child years ago. You know, we believe strongly that timing is timing. And when the timing is right, the information comes and you take those next steps. So just showing up, being here and learning, you know, it is hugely powerful. And uh, the guilt part, as hard as it might be, setting it aside puts you in a much better position to be in the moment for your child. Exactly. So that means do not compare yourself to a Pinterest parent. So this idea of the Pinterest parents is, you know, the one that shows themselves on social media, on Pinterest, Instagram, on their podcast or their blog as um, everything's stylized and wonderful. So these are pictures of remote learning where it's this gorgeous, organized, executive functioning dream workspace and there's a vase of flowers and it's just so zen and peaceful. That is really hard to achieve. And if you think about it this way, that Pinterest parent needs that for themselves to feel good about their situation, but that doesn't necessarily mean what you need for your situation. You need to focus on what makes you feel good as a parent just like that Pinterest parent is focusing on what they feel good as a parent. So your organization can be any style you want it to. If your child is sitting at the kitchen, kitchen table doing their learning and it's successful and it's working and you're able to be present and notice you know, when they need your help or they feel good about their learning, that is equally as good as the stylized remote learning situation. Um, and, you know, I think this seems obvious and people say it all the time, you know, don't do it alone. It takes a village. But truly, it really does. When you think about the best experiences you have had as a parent or as a teacher, you know, it's usually not like just you alone. There's there's other people involved. It's based on a conversation you had or it's something kind that somebody said to you, or it's working as a team with your child's school. So, you know, we do workshops and they're just on that, working 
as a team with your child's school. So if that's a problem and you feel like you're alone, you know, finding that one ally in the school building, it could be a teacher that was your child's teacher, you know, five years ago. It doesn't matter. It's just thinking about who is that person that gets it, that gets your child, whether it's ADHD, whether it's anxiety, a learning challenge, whether it's just your child's just having a tough time. Finding that ally can make all the difference in the world and not feeling like you have to do it alone. No one can do any of this alone. It's just not possible. We don't have, we're not equipped to do it alone. Um, so doing that, reaching out to others, also role models for your child that it's great to ask for help. It's positive to ask for help um, and that we all need it. Right. And one thing that I love is that if you find yourself in a teaching moment like that, being a role model for your child, you know, maybe reaching out to a neighbor, label it for your child so that they understand, say, you know what, this is really hard for me. I'm going to go ask my next door neighbor for help. And just that kind of language helps your child understand that asking for help is okay. And in fact, it makes everyone's situation better if they're feeling good about asking for help. And, you know, when we're talking about ADHD, um, and in this talk that we're doing today is for a whole bunch of different learners, but ADHD specific is all about extremes. So it can be extreme generosity. And on the other side, it might be extreme irritability or, you know, feeling the need to control something. So keep in mind that all of these wonderful strengths and talents that all of our children have oftentimes to to be able to model how to share that with others is really important it comes naturally to some and not as naturally to others so pick one parenting goal at a time so we always like to talk about this one at the top of a presentation because um, we're going to throw a lot of strategies at you. And if you're anything like me, you might want to run and try all of them in the same day and just see if they work, see if they work. But um, acknowledging that this is hard and it's a process and there's a timeline will help if you just pick one goal to work on, whether it's figuring out the homework process, designing your plan, practicing, and getting that one strategy going so it's running smoothly, and then you can move on to the next. And parenting goals can be as simple as yelling less and listening more. They can, that's actually not an example of simple because that can be really hard. It can be very hard to, to get out of that kind of pattern. Um, but it can be simple from, you know, where your child is grabbing their lunchbox or how they're gonna remember to put their shoes in a certain spot. There's all different things to think about and they might seem small but they're actually quite big. And every single goal you have, again, models it for your child, but part of your parenting goal might be something to work on with your child. So doing one thing at a time is really, really important. Okay, this is a big one. Um, are you reacting or responding? And this is something that Tracy and I talk a lot about individually with the students that we work with and the children that we work with and then also with the parents because this is something that I think everybody um, is guilty of from time to time because when our emotions are heightened and we're presented with a stressor or a trigger or that same situation that has happened over and over with our child we tend to react and we're reacting it's a big emotion it's unplanned um, this is when you might yell out impulsively what the consequence is gonna be. And it might be something like taking away electronics for the entire year, or you're grounded until you're 18. Usually we go to extremes when we're that emotional. emotional. And then what happens is we end up having to dial that back because it's unrealistic um, many, many times. So what we're looking to do is instead of reacting, you wanna to respond to the situation. And responding simply means that you're pausing and you're thinking about what's going to come next. Emotions can still be heightened, but maybe they're not as heightened because you've taken that pause and you have a planned response. And the planned response can be logical, it can be reasonable, 
and it can be consistent because you've thought about it in the past of how you're going to respond to these situations. Um, it gives you more control. And if you're feeling more in control in the situation, then everybody's emotions can settle that much quicker. Um, and, and we don't have it on the slide, but a, a great example of a strategy, a parenting strategy for responding would be using the word non-negotiable. So when there are certain things that are just not negotiable, you know, it's a, it's a rule, it's a bedtime, it's a curfew, it's something that you're not willing to budge on. The ADHD brain thrives on that argument and that negotiation. And in fact, it's usually like pretty spectacular at doing a good job at that argument or that debate because it gets fired up. Um, and even for children, you know, who are anxious, it's, it's engaging in their brain. So again, it's, it's firing it up. So using the word non-negotiable is something that you would talk with your child about ahead of time. You would say that, you know, when there's something that I, we're not budging on, I'm going to use the term non-negotiable and then I'm not going to say anything else. I'm not going to say, oh, I'm using the word non-negotiable now. I'm just going to say non-negotiable and that's it. And then you're not going to engage it. You are probably going to be in a situation where it's not going to be fun the first few times you use non-negotiable, but what it does to your child's brain is it just resets what they think the usual response or reaction is that you provide. So it basically sets the brain up for a whole new way to be able to disengage. Um, that would, that's one of our favorite ones to use. Um, and again, like Holly was mentioning, not trying all these strategies at once, but pick one and try it out and talk to your child about using it um, because you want them prepared for it. You don't just in the heat of the moment want to say non-negotiable and then have it turn worse. Prepare them ahead of time, which is this whole idea of a thoughtful next step. Mm -hmm. And also, we do have to acknowledge that we aren't perfect. We are humans. So if you do find yourself reacting instead of responding, just take a moment, sit down with your child and acknowledge your mistake. And again, that is such an incredible teaching moment because it's really hard for um, kids to sometimes admit their mistakes because they feel like they're making them all the time. And so if you model that for them, admit your mistake and show you how you're going to work on doing something differently next time, it gives them the opportunity to then later admit their mistakes and then learn and move on. Um, so step two is educate. So, you know, there's definitely a lot of misinformation out there um, on ADHD, sometimes on anxiety and all sorts of different things. Um, and sometimes we might get our knowledge from someone we know who's in a similar situation or their child's experienced or a teacher who has had a child with something similar going on. But it's so unique child to child, any of these areas of challenge that we're talking about that we really wanna make sure that we educate ourselves in a variety of ways so that the knowledge we're getting um, you know, comes full circle. And then we can take what we think makes most sense for us. So that means becoming an expert on your child. You probably already are an expert on your child. And if your child is struggling with something like ADHD or anxiety or weak executive functioning skills, do all the research that you can. And that can be um, like talking to your child's teachers. It can be asking the experts. It can be reading books and articles, listening to podcasts. It's basically just trying to get all of the knowledge you can so that you can best support your child. Um, and this final one we have is assemble a team for your child. Your child already has a team. Um, starts with you, starts with their family, but then there's also the team of teachers, their pediatrician, their coaches, their tutors. It's every adult involved in their life. You want to assemble that team because everybody brings something to the table that you can all learn from each other. And, you know, it's making me think, and we can add this to this slide, is we really should have, we have this as a later slide, um, but listening to your child 
because they're the best expert on their brain. They know what it feels like to be themselves. Um, and sometimes they don't always get listened to as far as what they're experiencing for themselves. So that's definitely you know, just as important as any of the other things that we just mentioned. Because um, truly the combination of parent and child, you are the experts. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you mentioned that. Tracy, because one of our favorite activities that we start off is when we're working with kids is to have them draw a picture of their brain and then to actually visually show us what's happening in their brain. What are they thinking about? What are their strengths? What are their challenges? And it really, um, I can't say I've ever done this activity and haven't been at least slightly surprised with what I learned from it. And it's usually a really good activity because kids like to do it and it gives them a different way to talk about it versus just asking the question. It gives them a vehicle. You know, I actually even have adult clients that I work with do the same thing. So it's fantastic. Any, any age group, definitely worth it. Um, so understanding an ADHD diagnosis is really important. Um, and thinking about the fact that it's not that a child with ADHD cannot pay attention. Um, it's that he or she has extreme attention and is paying attention to everything. So the trouble is really focusing on the task at hand when it's not such an exciting task, like a topic they don't like in school or chores, or it can be anything that's not a preferred task it can be very difficult. Um, you know, it's interesting, the more conversations you have with your child about this, they'll, they'll tell you through their description exactly what this is saying. You know, that idea that they notice everything going on around them all at the same time. Or people will describe it like a whole bunch of TVs, TV screens on with all different things and trying to figure out like, what am I supposed to be paying attention to in this moment? Um, and this part can look really different from person to person. Um, ADHD is definitely a heightened sensitivities to things. So for some it's noise might be more of the distraction. For some it's, they need noise to help block out distractions. Um, for some, it can be things like light or temperature. Um, for others, it can be um, sensory related and it can be clothing that they're wearing being distracting or being comforting. So there's so much to this one, but thinking about it this way because we usually think about ADHD as, you know, it's why can't you pay attention? People just can't pay attention. Where, you know, it's really not about that. It's more about the fact the brain's paying attention to everything at the same time. Um, which when you think about it, when somebody channels it and finds their career or a high interest activity, they usually outperform anyone else around them. So that's the cool part. So, Recognizing the ADHD difference. So um, Tracy talked a little bit about this before is that ADHD is all about extremes. So what that means is that, you know, a child can be easily distracted, but also hyper-focused. So on the one hand, there's trouble focusing on the task at hand. On the other hand, if it's something they're interested in, it's really hard to pull their attention away from it. So uh, these, sometimes these opposite end of extremes are difficult to understand because, um, the other example we have is excessively worrying or not worrying enough. So many, many times kids with, and adults with ADHD are champion worriers and they worry a lot about many, many things and their mind is just going so fast with many, many worries. But at the same time, they might not be worrying enough about a te upcoming test. And, you know, that's not what's on their radar for the worry. So it's these opposite ends of these extremes that make up ADHD. This can be being organized and disorganized at the same time. So organized in something they have a high interest area, but they're constantly losing their papers and can't find their other shoe. <laughs> so when you think about ADHD, just think about the two ends of the extremes. Mm. And Holly and I actually wrote a book together that is really focused on all of these extremes because they can be so confusing, but they can also be such areas of talent and strength um, that it's important to, to recognize what they all are. We love this. Here's a great one. example <laughs> because 
if any of you have children with ADHD and maybe sometimes just um, of anxiety or executive functioning can be challenged with this as well, is that they can be so focused on an idea and then all of a sudden completely lose interest. It's super common. Okay, so, so you want to keep going. This is I will. Expertise. I will. This is what I talk about all day. Um, if you have an anxious child, the number one strategy to use is to teach them the unknown. Many, many children with anxiety, they're always thinking about what's happening next. They're thinking about the future. They're, if they're having worries about it, they're wondering what could happen, what if. And it's all of these scenarios that spiral. And I always draw a tree and show them how trees grow branches. One worry leads to the next. And it's all about the future. So, if, sorry. <laughs> um, if you want to think about how to help this, you want to work on what's opposite of that, which would be if they're worried about what, what the unknown is, you want to give them that information. So imagine you have a child, an anxious child, who's sitting in class wondering what the rest of the day is going to bring, what's going to happen after school. So you want to prepare them for that, teach them what's going to happen after school, where will they be going, how will they get there, who will be there, and just try and anticipate what their questions will be and provide the answers. Of course, we don't always have those answers right away, but what you can do to kind of satisfy that need of teaching the unknown is have them write down the question or tell you the question and then let them know what you're going to do to find out the answer. And basically what that kind of does is it puts a stop to those that tree growing worry branches. It kind of cuts it off right there because there's a solution. Um, another way to look at this is a solvable problem. It's another phrase I use all the time mm -hmm. is I have them present what their problem is, what the worry is, and then we figure out how we're going to solve it. And it just prevents them from cycling and spiraling all those thoughts because there's an end to it. So that's, I think I could do 15 slides on that topic. So if there are any questions about it, please put them in the chat or um, we can certainly answer them at the end as well. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we touched on executive functioning skills. Um, we're trying to kind of give a little glimpse here of most important things to think about with some of the most common challenges. Um, so oftentimes executive functioning skills and weekend executive functioning skills get lumped into being lazy. Um, so often I'll have children, teens, adults who just feel like, oh, I just figured I was lazy. You know, where that's... Yes, can we be lazy? Sure, but there's so much more to it with weakened executive functioning skills. Um, executive functioning skills include skills necessary to start a task, to keep working on the task, and then to complete the task. So when you start thinking about like what that involves, if you have strong executive functioning skills, you know, you're pretty good. You're gonna get started, you're gonna keep working, and you're gonna finish. You might not always love what you do, but you get it done. But if you think about what's needed to do that, you have to think before you act. You have to be setting goals. You have to plan and prioritize. You have to manage your time. And then you have to remember what you're even doing, which seems like simple, but with weak executive functioning skills, it's not. You can really get overwhelmed quickly. Um, we often, you know, hear people thinking about executive functioning skills as just these kind of organizational skills physically, which is true, but they're also emotionally. So if your thoughts get all overwhelmed and you can't figure out how to slow that down or to organize it, you know, how are you going to ever start something, keep working on it and finish it? It's going to be really, really hard to do that. So we have this in this educate section so that you can start kind of if you're not already familiar with what goes into executive functioning, you can get a clear picture of that um, and help people who don't understand it, understand it with more clarity, help your child understand it. it executive functioning um, has nothing to do with, you know, how intelligent we are. We, executive functioning is about having all this information in our brain, but having it um, out of order. 
So like a file cabinet, you have all the information in there, but it's not in the order that's easy to access. It takes more time, it's frustrating, um, you get bogged down. So that's why we see these things happening um, with weakened executive functioning skills. The good thing is, is that you can learn them. 100% executive functioning skills can be learned. That doesn't mean that you as an adult, as a parent, your child or teenager is going to suddenly love being organized, but they can learn how to be organized in their own way. They can learn how to prioritize in their own way. And it might look really different than yourself. It might look really different than a teacher is recommending. So part of this is helping your child understand what might work for them. And sometimes it takes some trial and error to get there. But you will if you help your child understand what's happening and then help them figure out what's going to work for them, knowing it might not be your idea, which is really hard for very organized parents because they just don't understand how their child could be so disorganized. It doesn't make sense or it looks messy, but we always go with the evidence. If your child is finding what they need, work's done on time, they're not stressed about late assignments, you know, then maybe what appears to be a little disheveled on the outside might be working fine. And Tracy, um, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt right That's now, okay. but there was a question that came in in the chat and it, and it you know, it kind of relates to what we're talking about now in mm -hmm. the child figuring out their sense of identity. Um, and let me just bounce a question off you and you can do with it. Um, have you, have either of you ever spoken to kids who say they don't feel like themselves on medication? And how is having that experience of not feeling like yourself on the medication? Um, how does that impact the development of the child's sense of identity? Mm, good question. Holly, you want to go first? Do you want me sure. to? Sure. We actually um, get that question kind of a lot because, um, you know, medication isn't for everybody and it works really well for some. It really is an individual decision. Um, when a child comes to us or, you know, typically this comes from um, middle school or teenager who can articulate it a little bit better, we like to um, first start with asking them, you know, like what you know, who are they? What are they missing when they're on the medication? And we try and kind of narrow it down. Like, is it dampening their energy or their sense of humor or do they feel flat? And what I am looking for is um, really anything that is changing their personality. So, you know, some side effects can be managed, you know, like if, if we're looking at a sleep side effect or a nutrition side effect, there are things that we can put in place that can help and then the med medication can work optimally. Um, I personally don't like to see somebody who feels like their personality is changing. Mm -hmm. So if I hear something where it really is a true personality change, then usually what I'm doing is I'm suggesting that we kind of go back and have conversations with the prescriber and see if there are other options because sometimes a medication in the same class you know, if it's a stimulant, um, can work as well, but without that side effect, side effect, it's just a matter of what the medication is made up of. Um, it's really important that when people are taking medication that they feel confident and good and that it's helpful. Um, it, we don't ever want them to change who they are because um, like that's our priority. Our priority is boosting their self-esteem and letting them be who they are. And if the medication can be a tool to help them, great. But if it hurts who they are, then we need to go back to the drawing board. Yeah, and, and kind of on the flip side of that, um, it, it kind of inherent in the same question is when a medication is working well, then it can help with a child's feelings of um, identity and positive self-esteem because they're able to be the best version of themselves with friends, you know, at school, whatever it might be, um, when a medication is needed and when it's working. So sometimes that's a conversation we have with people when they're, you know, trying to make that decision, are we gonna try medication or not? And, and sometimes that's one way to think about it. You know, well, if we don't, are they going to actually be able to enjoy all their talents? So sometimes that, that question of identity definitely plays in there for, is it working, not working, or do we not try it and do other things? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hope that helps. 
So just before we go on to the next slide, I would, was thinking, Tracy, while you were talking about um, a client that we share together, and it kind of illustrates how we work together, but also um, I wanted to explain this example because we had a conversation last week. She is a senior in high school, um, getting ready to go to college, and um, she has weak executive functioning skills. She's on medication for ADHD. She does well in school, but has always articulated to me that um, she can't set the bar too high or things are harder for her because of her weak executive functioning skills. She's like, things are just harder for me. Um, and she's always getting labeled lazy or her report cards consistently say not putting in enough effort. Mm -hmm. So in our conversation, we started to talk about like what, what was the process for her when she gets assigned a, an essay due in two weeks. And if you look on paper, what happens, it looks like she starts the night before and turns it in a week late. But the reality is she started the moment it was assigned first by getting emotional and thinking about how hard it was going to be and stressed about it. Then thinking about all the different ideas and trying to narrow down these ideas and organize it in her head and they're coming rapid fire and then getting emotional again because she's stressed that she hasn't started. And it's this, this cycle where she's going through each of these emotional actions, but also struggling with her executive functioning. But when we broke all this apart, the reality is, is she was probably putting in a hundred times more effort than any other student because she started thinking about it day one and started pulling it all apart. But everybody had assumed that she didn't start it till the night before and was turning it in late. So what was important about this conversation is that she was able to see what the timeline is and then know what she needed to work on and when to put in the strategies that she works on with Tracy. So if she knows she starts getting emotional from day one, she does a strategy for me. And then when she starts to think about her ideas, she does probably a brain dump or something that Tracy has worked on with her. And it just kind of like organized it for her because she got educated about what was happening in her brain. Hmm. It's a great so example. Kind of a long-winded example, but I think so that illustrates what we're doing here. Yes. Um, so step three is all about communication. Um, Holly mentioned in the beginning, communication to us is at the foundation of any parenting strategy um, that you're going to use um, or teaching strategy for that matter, for those of you who are here maybe as teachers. Um, we love this one. This is definitely ADHD related. <laughs> yes. And I have actually worked with a child in sixth grade who um, was not initially diagnosed with ADHD because he had this superpower and it was not seen in the classroom because he was, he knew how to stare at his teacher when she was talking. Um, and so he was one of the ones that looked like he just wasn't putting in the effort, but Eventually he got his diagnosis and a 504 plan and everything worked out. <laughs> and again, some of these we can flip, you know, we could flip that and say the superpower is not looking at who's talking, having chaos around and still know every single word someone said. So there's that flip side of it for the ADHD brain that can do that. It's amazing. My brain cannot do that. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Um, so this first um, slide on communication is all about having visuals. Visuals are so important um, uh, to serve as checklists, reminders, to-do lists. Um, for some, having it on paper is best. For others, you know, I know everything's on screens lately, but some of your children and teens, you know, they do better that way. They do better when it's all in one location. Um, and they have some kind of message or um, reminder pop up. But the point is creating visuals are a really important way to communicate. So if it's something you want um, your child to do or complete, you know, writing it on a sticky note and handing it to them is sometimes better than going through a whole conversation. Um, I have some families I work with who they have a shared Google calendar. Um, and they put different things that the parent needs completed um, into a calendar because their child's looking at it for other things. So they automatically see what's on there with deadlines of when it needs to be done. Um, 
we've worked with people before you know who have giant sticky note reminders at, on their door so that they can't leave the house without seeing it um talk to your children or teenager or if you're doing this for yourself you know help them but let them help you determine what's going to work best and have them create it themselves. I mean, Holly's worked with people with writing in lipstick on the mirror of something that they are um, needing to remember. I've had people like create things and hang it from a ceiling. So they're going to like walk into it. So they have to remember it. Um, so the point is go visual as much as possible. Take pictures of organized materials or cubbies if you have young children and then post it next to whatever that organizational area is so they can match it up. Um, visuals just across the board work well. And I'm talking fast just because I wanna make sure we have time for questions. <laughs> it kind of transitions light right into the slide. Um, yes. Use fewer words. <laughs> um, the reason why we really like this strategy is because kids literally tell us that they hear blah, blah, blah. Um, or they say they hear the first part of what's being said, nothing in the middle, and maybe the last word that you said. So if you pare down any directive that you're giving your child to just a few words, um, you're, the fact that your message is going to get across um, much easier that way. <laughs> yes. Which this one kind of lends right into this one. Um, Tracy talked a little bit about this earlier when she was talking about the Q word non-negotiable. So what this is, is if you assign a one or two way, two word phrase for a really important directive that you give frequently, it's gonna create a template in their brain. So the example we have here is five minutes. Every single time you say five minutes, if you use it in repetition, your child is gonna know that not only are you leaving in five minutes, but they also have to have their backpack, their instrument, their sports equipment, or whatever they need to go out the door. Of course, you have to plan for that and say five minutes means this. But if you were to say, okay, in five minutes we're leaving, make sure your backpack is packed. Don't forget your water bottle. Do you have your lunch? Do you have your soccer ball for after school? Do you have everything? Because again, they're going to hear blah, 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 blah. So hopefully you can pare it down to just five minutes. And if you can pair it with a visual, hold your hands up, um, all the better for that extra layer. But that will help create the template in their brain so they know what five minutes means. We love keywords. <laughs> um, so this is definitely one of my favorites. Um, <laughs> not just the little picture, which is really funny. Um, but just thinking about listening actively um, by truly paying attention. We are all so busy and stressed and the pandemic has not helped with that um, for many. For some of you, maybe it's actually slowed things down and you've been more available because there's been more together time. Um, but this whole listening actively is so important. So, you know, before trying to solve whatever's going on for your child or before making assumptions about what their mood means or, you know, before asking your next question, is to just really listen to what they're saying, truly listening to what they're telling you and what you're sensing. Um, you know, this can be really hard, especially if it's something you're feeling emotional about, you're gonna want to interrupt or you're gonna want to give your perspective or you're gonna want to get your last point across. Um, but when we do that, it like drains all of the good stuff that your child's actually trying to tell you. Um, this does not mean when your child's screaming and it's a heated moment and they're swearing or being disrespectful. You know, it's not about you're going to sit there and listen to that without stopping. Um, but this is about when you're having conversations and sometimes they might be emotional, but as long as they're respectful, that active listening part is so important. I feel like I could talk about this one for days, days and days. <laughs> Okay, trying to go with less words here. Okay, this one, um, I love this one because <laughs> I'm guilty of this with my own children. Um, but so this, 
this happens when you have yelled up to your child 15 times that it's time to go to school and you try to do it in a calm voice the first five times and they're still not coming and they're still not coming and they're still not coming. And so you stomp upstairs and you get there and now you're angry and you yell and your child's like, why are you yelling? This is the first time you told me. <laughs> so maybe it's not you, but that can happen at my house. <laughs> um, so what's happening there is your child did not hear what you were saying the first 15 times you said it. They were either hyper-focused on something else or you know, maybe asleep or just paying attention to their music or whatever was happening. And it wasn't until you were right there in close proximity, right in their face, that they actually got the message that you were saying. They might have heard that you were talking before, but they weren't actually getting the message that you were saying something specific to them. <laughs> Um, so these are some of our um, favorite resources. We know they're kind of thrown up here for you, but we can definitely get you this information too. Um, they're just, you know, resources that we like. Of course, we like our own website, but there's other websites on here that we like. Um, Understood.org in particular is fantastic if you have not been on there before. Um, it's a wonderful resource where you can kind of pop in what you want to search for. Um, and what we've found over the years is it's really reliable information. Um, it's good, solid information. Right. Questions. Hey, we are. Well, for, first of all, thank you both so much. That was amazing. Um, and the, the first thing that I wanted to bring up was um, it, it was funny because when you were talking about the slide that described the flip side of ADHD, I was like, man, like they could do a whole presentation on this. And right as I was thinking it, Tracy actually said, oh, we wrote a book about this. <laughs> So I, if you could, if you, if one of you could put that in the chat, I just couldn't find the best link for that um, resource. So that would be great. Yeah. Um, and something else that I wanted to ask too, you know, if there's one piece of advice on being the difference, you know, in our children's lives, whether they have ADHD or anxiety or, you know, whatever the case may be, I mean, because especially now, like I remember when I was an adolescent, I mean, it was tough, but I can't even imagine what it's like now in 2021, you know, being uh, a preteen or a teen with all this pressure. So what would be that one sort of pivotal piece of advice that you would give? So mine is definitely, definitely always that one about listening. Like, ask your child or your teen and then really listen because you're you're right Matt the amount of pressure that children and teens are under is enormous and I think it is hard to understand unless you're that young person going through what they're going through um, so the more you can learn the more you're going to be there for your child and the more you're there that the more of a difference that you're making um, Holly, what do you think? What's your, what's your favorite? Would, my favorite is become the expert on your child. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you naturally keep the bar high for them and you accept them unconditionally. And I have talked to so many, particularly teenagers and early twenties, kids that have later told me that it was um, those that believed in them is what got them through. So if you never give up on your child, you have unconditional love and acceptance, they will keep pushing through all the challenges. And if you're the expert on your child, you can be there to help them with them. Oh, yeah, that's such a good one too. So hard to have just one favorite. <laughs> um, and Holly, to piggyback off what you just said, is there one piece of advice that you can give that will help parents influence that sense of curiosity in their children to keep learning about who they are um, and, and how they operate and, and things like that. Absolutely. So, um, you know, we always talk about being your best self and, you know, that's kind of a catchphrase that's everywhere right now, be your best self. And when I talk to kids about that, I want them to know and figure out what do they enjoy the most? What are their high interest areas and what are they good at? 
we spend so much time working with kids on, you know, where, what they need to be better at, you know, you put this strategy in here, there, and it's, it's, you know, important, but we also want them to focus on what comes naturally to them. Everybody has one talent or one skill or one passion that they're good at. So it's really important to help them understand that and nurture it. Yeah, awesome. I love that. And, and there was a question um, that came in asking about the slides. Will the slides be available? Oh, sure. We okay. can definitely, we can turn it into like a little handout kind of thing too. And okay. um, yeah. And one more question uh, in here. Um, do you have any recommendations of books or podcasts for a teen girl with ADHD to teach her about her own brain? Mm. That is a really good question. There is, and I, there is one that I will, you know what I'll do is I have to think of it. I can't think of what her name is. It's like, so there's an, uh, I can't remember her name either. There's a woman on YouTube who is yes. really fantastic at understanding um, ADHD. She has ADHD herself. She's an actress, um, right? She's like early twenties. Yeah. Oh, I, I can't know. think of her name. But we can, we can get that information. Yeah. How it's very good and very relatable. Yes. That's probably the best one I've seen that feels like real but also has like concrete strategies that, that go with it. That's the best one. Is, is, is she, she may have put the name of um, the channel, the YouTube channel in here, How To ADHD. I, don't I, think, that, I think that, I think that might be it. Oh. Yeah. I think that might be it. Um, yes, and please. for people who, Think of questions later. Please don't hesitate to send us an email. Um, it's info at navigatingadhd.com. Um, we'd love to answer any questions. I know I don't usually think of questions until later. So later on, if you think of anything, please um, don't hesitate to reach out. We're more than happy um, to help. Um, and if it's not us or we don't have an answer, we'll figure out who does. Yes, and I will, I will put their email in the follow-up email I send out um, in addition to the slides um, and the, the recording. Um, awesome. yes, the slides are going to be emailed out. Yeah, we'll get, the, we'll get those right out to you today. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, once again, Holly and Tracy, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate it. Um, this was a, an awesome presentation and, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be here sitting on the zoom until one, if anyone else has any other questions. Okay, great. Thanks so much for having us. And thank you everybody for taking the time. Nice to meet everyone. Thank you. you. <laughs> thank you guys. That was great. And thank you everybody for joining. Anybody has any questions, any last minute questions for any of us or for Fusion Academy specifically? I'm happy to answer those. Well, Holly and Tracy, that was awesome. And we'll have to continue it. I don't know if you saw that message in the chat, but uh, Oh, no, you could certainly uh, go down a lot of different rabbit holes here, but, um, but this was great. And I think uh, we would love to do this again in the future. So fantastic. We love it. Thank that was a lot so of fun. Thank you. Yeah, I, I got, that was awesome. I, that was, that was so awesome. I appreciate that a lot. Good. Thanks. Great presentation. Um, glad. Oh, I got a lot out of it myself. Good. I love the non-negotiable. I, I have a one-year-old at home. Uh, oh, start it now. So, yeah, start it young, right? Yeah. <laughs> early. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that one really works well. It, it really does. Um, there's just nothing engaging about saying non-negotiable.